here we go. So do I need to go over the explanation from previous time? Well, it's not quite in my element, so perhaps what I spoke about was uh, what made a very little sense. Right? Do you remember this idea? So when we count, we really have to, to uh, take account of two things. Do the object look to us the same, or do they look to us as different objects? Okay? Uh, it is also possible to have this, so I always use it, so metaphysically, any two objects that don't occupy the same space are distinct objects. I can imagine them to be distinct if that is useful, okay? So it is true that, let's say, one toilet paper roll and another toilet paper roll are not the same object, correct? Because they are in the same, uh, well, they are in the same time, at the same time in different places in space. So they're not the same object. But uh, there is no, we cannot really tell them apart. I cannot say this is toilet paper one and this is toilet paper two, or there are the other way around. Make sense? So I cannot tell them apart. Similarly, if I have one soda can and another soda can of the same type, I cannot tell them apart. So uh, the last lecture was um, counting how many ways are there to distribute some number of objects that look to us identical among non-identical destinies. Okay, so in, in the first example I gave was uh, five toilet paper rolls. Well, obviously each toilet paper roll looks like any other toilet paper roll, and it's to be divided among six hypochondria. So each hypochondria is a unique individual. So that's uh, five identical objects to be divided among six non-identical destinies. That's how I think it is, good. It's different from the um, multinomial coefficient because in multinomial coefficient, what do we have? We have non-identical objects distributed among non-identical destinies. Does it make sense? Do I need to go over that uh, more, guys? Uh, the derivation for you are all clear on that. So please don't hesitate if you want more explanation on that. I'm happy to go over more explanation. Or tell me, yes, I'm good, and we can move on. Text, please. Okay, yes, 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 we're good. So, a few of them. Anybody who wants to go over that, uh, don't be shy. You read the notes, you understood what I, uh, what I did here, correct? And uh, the very last few problems, they can be a little bit uh, big, but there you have my solution, so you might understand what I, what I meant, right? So remember, we had, I just imagine this question to just have uh, negative integers, right? So uh, that was you have to pay the mafia at least $10,000. And uh, you don't have any money left, but you have in your family silver spoons. And each spoon is $1,000, okay? So you have two such spoons. Your grandma has six such spoons. And your family, your, your parents have four such spoons. So I asked uh, question A, in how many ways can you do this? Can you basically, so you have to, you, you have to, among those spoons, you have to pay them up, right? So in how many ways can you do that if you will try to burden your family as little as possible? And by that I meant that, uh, well, you will give away all your two spoons. And so here you have possibilities. X1 is how many spoons will you give to your grandmother? And by give to your grandmother, if you give her, let's say, minus two, that means you have taken away two spoons, you understand? So x1 has to be a number bigger than or equal to minus six. x2, your parents. How many spoons do you give? You see, negative is also giving. It's a negative type of giving. So minus four is the smallest amount of spoons you can give to your parents. And to the mafia, it has to be at least 10 because uh, you have to pay ten thousand dollars So that was the equation. And... Uh, my solution was four to two equal to six. And then in the other possibility, let's say we are not very interested in preserving the spoons in the family, which I interpreted to mean uh, that there are four destinies for, for the spoon. So altogether, I have 12 spoons, right? Two that uh, are mine, uh, another uh, four and six. But 12 spoons altogether. And then here I will decide uh, x4 is uh, how many spoons um, do I keep for, keep for myself? X3 is how many spoons I give to the mafia. And, and um, basically, so I just gather all the spoons together and I distribute them among those deaths uh, with those requirements. 
And uh, based on the generalized uh, generalized way of doing that, it seems that I will have 10 possibilities. You understand? So I see faces that are um, like the Egyptian state. I cannot uh, tell what's the secret inside. Alejandro, do you understand? I understand, Professor. Great. Sorry that I picked on you. I just, uh, I just had to pick some random things. Um, so, so for for A, for A, uh, um, well, I mean, you can think about. We can talk about A again in different uh, in different ways. Uh, I just want to go to the next lecture, Paul, and uh, we'll think of it a bit later. Okay. Don't want to uh, to stop right now with those questions. All right, so let's move on to the final chapter, final uh, lecture of combinatorics. Okay, so let's see what what happens here. We have fifty two cards, and they have to be divided among four players. So type in your solution. How many possibilities are there of a couple? Okay, Bowen. Okay. And the rest of you. Great, Chabelle. Okay. Oh, so, Paula, good question. We will, uh, we will mention it in a moment. So that can also be done, so Valeria, uh, I, I, I think. So are you ready, guys? So there are obviously not one way of solving this. I think of it, and my, again, my recommendation, uh, we can practice more problems in office hours where, you know, maybe from the textbook you can tell me how to solve it. My, my suggestion is always imagine a document. So I draw it for you, but eventually you can just imagine what it is. So what I imagine is a code, uh, and the code will be this one box. You can write you can write the full code over here. Underneath you have red P1, blue P2, green P3, and uh, what is it? Purple, whatever the color is, uh, P4. Right? What color is it, by the way? Purple. So I'm really seriously asking, but. So what happens here? So what is the code going to look like? So I have 52 cards, and I think of the 52 cards, each card is an individual. So it's like the 52 knights. And uh, the players are the dragons. So we have four dragons here. And each player requires exactly 13 cards, correct? So in this box, uh, 30 numbers go, in this box, 13. And in each box uh, here of each color, you, we need exactly 30 numbers. Good. So, when and how do I put those numbers? So, whatever numbers are assigned to P1, I write them in increasing order from smallest to largest number. You understand? So, I imagine those codes. And then, uh, how to do that? Well, how many um, how many permutations? This each permutation, if I write any any sequence of numbers, clearly determines the destiny. Correct? If I write, let's say. 1 through 52, that will mean that the first uh, 13 cards are here, the next 13 are here, the next 13 are here, increasing order. So clearly, each permutation describes the destiny. But there are several permutations that describe the, seven, the same destiny. That's why we divide. Okay? 13 factorial to the power of 4. In other words, whatever numbers are here, there are 13 factorial rearrangements, 13 factorial rearrangements here, here, and here. Uh, that means that 13 factorial to the fourth power is how many permutations describe the same destiny. So if I take so that each, each, each particular permute, so, so there are 13 factorial to the power of four synonyms to each destiny. You understand? That we, we develop code. The 52 factorial are my, all the codes that I have, but many of the codes correspond to the same exact situation. So I, I count the synonyms, okay? 
So that's why I divided because each uh, meaning has exactly the same number of synonyms. I divide by 13 factorial to the fourth. If it's where if, if different meanings had different number of synonyms, this procedure will not work. So everybody understands how that was developed, this number. And um, you can write it as 52, 13, 13, 13, which means distribute 52 objects among four dragons or four players, and each requires 13 of those distinct objects. Good? That's why it's this number. Make sense, guys? Uh, so uh, I think it, it makes sense, right? Yes, each player is unique, Bowen, precisely, right? Each player is a, is a unique destiny. So when I imagine the fold, I have to imagine this. When I imagine this perfectly, I, I think I can avoid making some mistakes. Okay, that's what I imagine. And that's how I base my counting. I'm just counting how many, uh, how many different folds I have here. That's 52 factorial, but uh, uh, some of the papers in which I have distinct folds correspond to the same destiny, so I staple them into one file. And another destiny, I sta staple them into another file, and I just need to count the number of files. That's the number of files. But so now here is the next situation. We now have 52 cards and they have to be divided among four files and of course divided equally. How many outcomes? Okay. Okay. Let's see. I would like to as uh, many of you guys as possible type participate, so I can. I'm not trying to catch you, just so that I can see if you are all on the same page. If you all understand. Uh, Kazi, uh, why do I divide by 13 factorial in here? I, I divide actually by 13 factorial to the fourth power in the previous question. Yes. So the idea is, is this, because um, whatever numbers I have here, there are 13 factorial ways of rearranging them. There are 13 factorial ways that I can put uh, the numbers that end up in the red box. There are 13 factorial ways in which I can write the numbers that end up in the blue box, etc. right? So if I just consider only the, uh, the codes, uh, so some of the codes are, mm, no, there are several different codes that will produce the same result. For example, so, yeah. wouldn't you multiply then instead? Because like those are different, and they're uh, different outcomes. Well, well, well. Um, think about what I do. So, what am I counting? So, you have to have a very, very clear picture of what I'm counting. Imagine each document contains uh, the listings uh, of the numbers one through fifty-two. So, I have one through fifty-two. Mm -hmm. I have. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see that if I print each listing like this, into, into this into this form, I print each listing. Correct. I will have 52 factorial documents. It's a huge number, but I hopefully you can see why it's 52 factorial. Yes? Mm -hmm. now, yeah. If I, if I start looking, let's say, let's say the numbers uh, were in the, in the red box, let's say one through 13 in order, right? But if I see another, I might see another document where these begins with two, then one, then three, then four. So there are 13 factorial. Oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah, so basically, you can imagine jumping those numbers around or, or combining or just actually. Right, right. Okay, got it. Got it. Thank I you. I vigorously is having this form and then uh, having a synonym check. I just verify that each particular meaning. So meaning means uh, a particular card. Let's say one through 13 cards are here. Uh, 14 through the next batch through 28, I think, is here, etc., etc., etc. Right? So that's one destiny. I, I, I look at this destiny and I ask myself, uh, what are the codes that are going to correspond to this destiny? And I can, I will, I can create a document that counts the synonyms. And th there will be a 13 factorial to the power of four synonyms because I can rearrange each of the 13 cards in, in each of the box. Destiny is only changed when the number in the red box jumps to a number not in the red box. Right, because the order of the 13 cards doesn't matter. They're all yeah, synonyms the order of each doesn't other. Matter. As long as the, the 13 cards in this box, they, it, it's going to be a package shipped to uh, player one. So okay, thank you. No Good, you see that? Thank you. Yeah, so I got it. Thanks. I, I actually imagine documents. I imagine stacking them up. I imagine all this thing together, right? And then, and then I avoid uh, making mistakes, hopefully. There are still things that can go wrong, okay? So uh, thank you guys for participating. Now, what happened here 
is that uh, the piles are no longer unique. You understand? If let's say the number is one through 13, go into this box, and uh, you know, it, it basically the numbers go in order into this box, this box, this box, this box. This box. I, can, uh, I can uncouple the boxes and rearrange them in any other form, and that doesn't change the destiny because uh, there is no red, blue, uh, green, or purple. I think it's purple. You never correct me, so uh, I'm not sure what it is. Good. You understand you can couple and uncouple. So there are 14 factorial ways of uncoupling. So I already counted. I already imagined uh, uh, I created a system uh, in which, thank you, Kazi. I, I created a system in which now I know it's uh, existing, right? So I, I, I don't need, I can create a call that I can count directly. And uh, the call that I count directly is that I have to place here the numbers one through whatever numbers are here, have to go in, uh, in, in order. Make sense? They have to be from uh, smallest to largest. Whatever numbers are here, whatever numbers are here from smallest to largest, because that is that is the representation that I put on the top of my document file, and uh, I can count those codes now directly. Then why? Because the counting of it directly will be 52, 13, 13, 13, or well, choose uh, all those 13, which is this. Okay. So I already have, so I imagine printing all the uh, for for second problem. I imagine printing all the documents. There are going to be this many documents. And then I now see that we have, we have new synonyms because I can take whatever is in the red box and I can place it in here. I can just uncouple and change their position. That's why uh, I divide by an extra one over four factorial. And so because with my new coding method, where now those numbers are in order, first it was uh, all the permutations in any order. Now whatever is in the red box is in order. You understand this? I'm repeating it, but hopefully that you are seeing the code. It's all about a, a matter of seeing codes. And uh, so what happens here, now we see that with my with this new coding system, uh, there are four factorial repetitions for each mean. So I divide it further by four factorial. Good? All right, so here is the next question. Uh, uh, three, uh, 52 cards are divided among four players, and each player uh, has to receive any number of cards between zero and 52. So it's like uh, the cards are now. Are, are now um, so uh, okay. So uh, Valeria, that's for question three that you're asking. Yes, mm -hmm. that you're answering. Okay. So uh, think about uh, fifty-two. What is the situation there? Okay, Eric. Uh, okay. So uh, a bunch of you will say four to the power of fifty-two. What about the rest of you? Okay, wonderful. Okay, you all agree? And that's pretty good if you do. So here is uh, the solution to it, okay? So in this case, I my Kafka document is different, right? I imagine the card, that's experiment one. So, so there are 52 cards. The card, I, I want to know uh, where it goes. So it has four possibilities for four players to go. So I have here 52 boxes, and each box has uh, four possibilities of assignment, right? So it is four times four times four. It's four to the 52. Do you understand? You know, it's not, guys, it's, it's, you see, you see why, why I, I mean, there are all sorts of mistakes I can make, but if I, Develop a clear plan of how uh, I uh, interpret. How do I know which card was assigned where? And then I know how to count it. So it's uh, it's 52 experiments, and the outcome of each experiment is a number between 1 and 4. So it's 4 to the 52. Melissa, clear? Yes, thank you. Understood. Good, guys? Oh, and this one might be very difficult. I'm not sure. Right? So, so, uh, so now 52 cards are divided into four piles, and the piles are no longer of equal size. What can you do now? You understand? So uh, let's say if it's four piles, we don't want empty piles. That's uh, somewhat uh, meaning, right? So let's consider we have four piles. Each pile contains at least one card, because if it's, if it's let's say, if a one pile is empty, so there are three piles. Okay, so four piles means that each pile contains at least one card. 
but uh, the piles are not on the same side necessarily. What to do now? Yes, Bowen. Right. So we will talk about uh, how I try to solve it, right? and you, will, you might afterwards think if yes. But but you understood, for example. So confusion is of several types. Uh, you all guys understood what you were trying to count, correct? You can imagine what you're counting. Am I right? So in this case, uh, uh, what we're doing is it's something weird, right? So the previous chapter. We examined how to uh, partition identical objects among non-identical destinies. Here, uh, the size of the file is kind of a bit. It, it's a files are, are uh, files are only determined by the elements they contain. Make sense? All right. So you all try to solve this problem, guys. And uh, has anybody come up with a solution? I see one person said something here, Bowen said something, and uh, the rest, um, you don't know yet. So let me know if, if you want me to right away go over the solution or you want to suggest me a solution. Can we do it together? Like, can oh, obviously we will. I'm just asking uh, if oh, okay. you're ready to see the, uh, the my solution, right? So right, yes, Volver. So just write why if you mean if you want me to go ahead. I just want to be sure that I'm not spoiling anyone's fun. Gabriel, you say four to the power of forty-eight. Interesting. Okay, let me know when you're ready. Just write why. Or R, I don't know, right? Ready. Okay. You don't like to, to write R or Y or something, right? So here is uh, how I, I thought of this problem. I could not figure out a way to, uh, to have a neat answer to it, but I can make a, a recursive uh, function or a recursive sequence that will figure it out, okay? And this is the idea that I came up with of the recursive sequence. Okay, so first I define n sub k of little n, and that means uh, we have four files and we partition n objects. Make sense? So this is supposed to do this counting. I, I don't know what it is, but we have a machine that will do this uh, counting now. With me? So, for example, there are some values that are very easy for us to figure out. If I want to divide n objects into n files, there is only one way to do this. Do you agree? n sub n of n, it's one. Because uh, again, there, nothing distinguishes a file from another except uh, the element it contains. Good? So you understand why this is one, yes? And also, if I have one file and I have an object, there is also only one way to do that because I just take all those objects and put them in that one file. Good? It's like one basket put all the objects. So how many ways of doing that? Only one. And this is also only one. And uh, another thing is also obvious is that if the number of files is bigger than the number of uh, objects, then uh, there is zero ways of doing it. Agreed? Because, uh, well, if there are more files uh, than objects, more, more baskets than objects, some baskets are empty. So I cannot do it. Okay? So those are the obvious parts. Now, here is what I uh, suggest to do. Uh, so the recursive, the recursive formula is this. Focus on object numbered n, OK? So the number of ways to partition into k files is uh, k minus 1, n minus 1 if object n is separate. It's basically, if object n is separate, it means he is the one making the last file. or if object n is contained with some other object, then we, we multiply n, we have n sub k n minus one and we multiply it by k. That's when the object is not alone in the file. So what I imagine doing is I imagine counting how many ways to 
break n minus one into k files, and then the nth object belongs to file number one or file number two or file number three, all the way to file number k. Each file is distinguishing, right? So somehow I imagine a lot, uh, assigning numbers to them, and then I place the object uh, n into one of the files. Make sense? So here is how this formula works for small numbers. Let me just show you that. And of course, ask me questions. So let's suppose that I want to calculate the number of ways of distributing four objects among three files. Okay. So what we have is uh, how many ways are there to uh, to do that uh, if uh, if I have uh, if, if I want to calculate how many ways are there if uh, if the fourth if object number four is alone in the file if object number four is alone in the file here it is right so the file is here is file one file two file three object four is alone in the file so what is the possibility we have now two remaining files that have to be filled right two baskets that need input so it could be that uh, one is together with two and three is also alone or it could be that one and three is together and two is alone or one is alone and two and three are together so uh, so there are exactly three possibilities yes you see that i just uh, here i just uh, counted uh, manually what's uh, uh, what's the situation where the fourth object is contained alone you see that's how it's broken this means fourth object is contained alone and this means fourth uh, fourth object not contained alone make sense so on the other hand, suppose that uh, that the fourth object is not alone. We have uh, three files and they are not empty. Okay, three files and then the remaining. So fourth object is not alone. So what? But the possibility, the only possibility of doing that is uh, object one, two, and three are there, and four is uh, next to one of them because four is not alone. Four has to be with somebody else, right? So here I imagine there is a maybe an empty space where I can place a four, here's an empty space where I can place a four, and here's an empty space where I can place a four. There are three possibilities. Good. So uh, uh, so this those possibilities then three of three is one. Now here is the uh, here is the, in general the form that I will have uh, where the nth object is not alone in the file. So this is just listing the file sequence. I mean, imagine labeling each file with an integer. So here I list the code that represents a particular file. And this will then uh, tell me here in which file it belongs. Is it file one, file two, all the way to file uh, to file k. So there are k possibilities here. That's why you multiply. Okay, hopefully you understand it. And here is uh, uh, the calculation uh, where I apply the recursion. So n of three, n three of four is n two of three plus three times n three of uh, three. And this I know because it's uh, the same numbers, I know it to be one. So this is just three. Now I want to understand what this number is. So that's n one of two plus two times uh, n two of two. And what is this? This is uh, clearly because this number is one. So this is one. What is this? This is also one, but, but multiplied by two, so it's two. And this is uh, already three, so we have one plus two plus three, which is eight. But uh, do you understand how I figured it out, guys? So the answer to this problem is n sub four of fifty-two, which uh, doing by hand, of course, it will be correct. It will never fix it, right? But uh, this procedure uh, can recursively figure it out. I did not find a way of doing that without the work. Any questions? Well, what, what you just uh, you just need to figure. You just you, see, you have a question. You figure it to the best of your ability. Sometimes recursion is the best way to go. In very difficult problems, maybe the only way to go. Okay. Uh, okay. Next question. Uh, Fifty-two cards are now dipped into black ink, so they are no longer distinguishable. How many ways of Dividing them into four equal files. We have four files. Each card is exactly like like an option. Okay, Shotaro, you say. 
something? One way, standing here. Because cards are indistinguishable, it should be clear if so there's only one way. Because here are the black cards. And um, there is no reason to decide which of the cards I take. So I just uh, take, I just put them in a row, no matter which way. And I take the first batch, the next batch, the next batch, the next batch. There's uh, only one way of doing it. Okay. Now, obviously, more than one way because each, if you, if you consider each card, metaphysically speaking, is different from another card. You cannot make them distinguish, right? But uh, if I do not care uh, which particular card go uh, go where, because they are the same, it's like uh, dollars. So it doesn't matter. I can do it like. Uh, okay. Now, question number six: sixty-two black cards. They are not distinguishable. Are divided into four, but possibly unequal piles among four players. How many outcomes are possible? Go ahead. Okay, Valerium. All right, Alejandro. So, all right, so it looks like you understand how to figure out this problem, yes? So, what we have here is uh, identical objects like cards or money uh, to be partitioned into four categories, four uh, non identical categories. X1 is player one, X2 is player two, etc. So we are counting the number of solutions to the equation where the summation is 52. Yes? And uh, we remember it's, it's like the match problem. Remember the little girl with the matches? So we have uh, 52 identical matches and we have four little girls. So each girl has to receive at least one match. So what do you do? You, you have 51 spaces between them, correct? Remember the matches and the 51 spaces between them. And the reason you choose three of the spaces is because choosing one space partitions into partitions the matches into two piles. Choosing two spaces partitions the matches into three piles, but we need to partition them into four piles. Okay, so it's fifty-one choose uh, three. I imagine uh, the fifty-one spaces between the matches, and I choose the three spaces. And uh, between the spaces uh, is where I decide between zero space chosen and first space chosen is the matches that go to uh, person number one. Good, so it's 51 choose three. Okay, now questions are getting uh, hopefully more interesting. Um, 10 children come to a party. Three of them are very good friends and we will only sit together. How many ways of sitting them in a row? That's question A, and B is uh, the same thing, but for Mary go around. So for now, write A and the solution, okay? For A guys, okay? So we're doing A. With me? We're all doing A. And uh, again, guys, what, uh, to be sure, how do you avoid making a mistake? You have to clearly, uh, you have to have a document that establishes whether you are right or wrong. What? Okay, Gabriel, or not right. So uh, for question A, are we ready? Mm -hmm. All right, let's do. This is my Kafka document. So the friends are going to be, well, they're going to be made into a human centipede, one way to think of it. They are going to be made into one creature. 
So here is uh, our experiment. So we have friend A, B, C, or you can call them one, two, three, it's up to you. That's category of friends. They are going to be connected together. The other objects are kept as separate entities. Yes? So how so so what I can observe if it's in a row, I observe the bunch uh, of the centipede of three friends and uh, the other objects uh, somehow piled to uh, some, somehow arranged in a row. Okay. So here is how I made the, the arrangement. So the friends are friend A, friend B, and friend C. So here is my Kafka document. So this tells me how to combine. Okay, this is how to combine them into one object. So in other words, when I look at the friend, when I look at the seating arrangement, I will see the objects, the, the individuals, and somewhere in my row, I see the three friends consecutively, correct? And if I see them consecutively, I want to know two things to determine the full arrangement. How are they seated? So this is the friends. I can put them as A first, B first, B second, and C last. And then uh, this is identified as category one. And then uh, I can look at the, at the categories, right? Where are they together? So, th so there are 10 people together. There are three here. The three were made into uh, a one person. Uh, so it's seven plus one, which is eight. Eight individuals. You understand this is individual, super individual one, and the others are two way, all the way to eight. Okay. So look at you. If you read this string, you will know exactly what happened. Here. So what does this describe? This means that my my friends, my three friends, are seated at the beginning of the row to the left. Right. If I put one here, it means they are all seated to the left, and this is describing how they are seated. And this describes how the other categories are seated. Good. So now it's very clear that I can fill this box as I like, and I can fill this box as I like. Uh, you, you know, the, the numbers have to be in order, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a sequence. Like this can be any one of eight, this can be any one of seven, etc. So there are eight factorial ways to fill the second row of boxes, and there are three factorial ways of uh, fill the first row of boxes. So it's three factorial times eight factorial. Do you understand how I made it? Right, guys, so, so that I don't make mistake, I, I imagine I'm counting the code. So this code is supposed to tell me, so I read this code, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to know where my where everybody is sitting. And if, if, if I set them correctly, I can translate it to, into a code. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between codes and uh, outcomes. So then I can just count the codes and be sure that I haven't um, overcounted or undercounted. Good. Now, the harder part is question B. How many ways of seating them on a merry-go-round? And that might be even vague for you. What is a merry-go-round? What does it mean to seat them in a merry-go-round? Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. So it's important to understand what is a merry-go-round. I will explain uh, what it is. Okay, Paula and Gabriel, interesting. Interesting, Naomi. You see, guys, you need to construct uh, this code system, the Kafka document, because otherwise, uh, you know, you might be right, you might be wrong. And when you communicate to me how you will solve something, you either construct a Kafka document on the exam or uh, you indicate to me how is it that you carry the Kafka. But they can figure out whether you're right or wrong faster. Okay, Melissa, interesting. All right, so let's uh, let's see what is my uh, my document and what do I mean by a merry go round. Okay, so here is what happens if you have linear order. Right, imagine uh, you are reading. The letter is A, B, C, D. It's one word, right? So with, with the, when it's on a flat sheet of paper, you know that this is the beginning and this is the end, correct? So that's a linear arrangement. What do you think is a merry-go-round or cylinder arrangement? Right? In a cylinder arrangement, I take this and I Circle. and I glue and I glue on a drum, or I, I glue onto a cylinder, and then I see A, B, C, D. And you see, you might still see this dotted line, but imagine I erase it. So now you have a cylinder and it's A, B, C, D, and there is no indication of where you start and where you finish reading the word. Yes? 
that's what I mean when, it, when it's a numerical round, but it has, it's still a flat, it's still a parallel arrangement, but there is no indication of what's beginning and what's end. So when you see the very go around rotate, uh, you can imagine, for, or, or if you start trying to read it, you can read the, the word A, B, C, D, or the word B, C, D, A, or the word C, D, A, B, or the word D, A, B, C, and they mean exactly the same thing. You understand? So all those words, they mean exactly the same thing. Uh, what, what happened here is that you assumed that the beginning was A, here you assume the beginning was B, here you assume the beginning was uh, C, and here you assume the beginning was D. So very go around means that you can no longer tell what's, uh, you can just, you have an arbitrary beginning, right? That's the, and, and therefore an arbitrary end. As soon as you specify the beginning, you know the end. It's going to be, the, the beginning is the end. Okay? So when I, I can use the same form as I used before, Except, you see, I can decide how am I going to look at the merry-go-round. I am going to look at it so that, uh, you see, so the reader, how, how am I going to indicate uh, unambiguously how to read it? I would say that focus on A. As soon as you see A, start reading. So in the category of friends, as soon as I see the first of the friends, I begin reading. You understand? So it begins with category one. You follow, guys? So I begin with category one. And uh, this is not no longer, um, you know, it's no, it's it's no longer a free walk. It's always one, because uh, whenever you go around, goes around. I mean, I look at the pattern. I can say, okay, here, I see, I see the first of the three friends, and that's when I begin uh, reading. So this is always one. So that that's why this is still can be arranged. The, the three friends can still be glued uh, together in a particular order, right? And this means uh, a start reading, let's say in this case, if A is the first, uh, uh, is the first uh, in linear order to appear, I will start reading from, the, from A and onward. Yes? So this means uh, I, I see them, I basically create a linear order. Basically, the cylinder order means that I can make the cut and bring it back to this uh, flat piece of paper shape or wherever I want. I can do it at any level, okay? So here, um, in my procedure, I will focus on the friends, and the friends will always be to the left. Okay? So in this case, I begin seeing, I, I first see A, B, C, and then I see the other categories. There are three factorial ways of uh, filling this information out, and seven factorial ways of filling uh, this information out. So when you uh, see the word raw or merry-go-round, you should think of deducting one from somewhere. Yes, uh, because because the reason you think of deducting one from somewhere because you are because able to, uh, mm -hmm. to decide where you want the paper to begin, understand? Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever is, in the, in the previous case, in the linear ordering uh, here, the friends would be anywhere, right? But here in the cylinder, I can make them the beginning always. So I can make it always be one. Because I can decide to cut the mirror go around and make it into a linear ordering by focusing on the friends. Hey, professor. Oh. Yes. Quick, quick question. This okay. is not calculus, right? <laughs> no, it is not calculus. It's probability theory. Oh, I think I'm in the wrong class. <laughs> uh, are you in my class? In yeah, I think I'm in the Tuesday class. I, oh, I, yeah, I would have hoped that you say, oh my God, I've never known it's so interesting. And he wanted to <laughs> okay. Uh, my bad. I'll leave. Well, you can stay, but that's you. Take care. I have class. I have another class at this time. That's why I thought I had this yeah, class. Other classes are not important. So, <laughs> so uh, only my class is important. Why? I'll because unless you are taking more advanced mathematics than maybe I'll use. But uh, it, uh, probability is very interesting, by the way. Uh, know, I bet it is. Uh, yes. You know, for example, that in Israel, they're going to start uh, the second lockdown, right? And why? Because they don't understand probability. They decided they, they, they abandoned their interest in uh, the subject or in common sense. So, Wait, they started in certain what? Wave. In, oh. other, in other words, uh, you know. Uh, in, in but it's Germany, everywhere. In, but it's oh, everywhere. It's, right, it might be here as well, so, right? Like we are on Zoom. Yeah. Why are we on Zoom? Because we're afraid to, uh, to contaminate each other, supposedly, right? Uh, so, okay. in yep. Israel, uh, they are already locking down, so you will not be able to, if, you're, if, you, if you live in Israel, you cannot leave your house starting on Friday. You see? <laughs> they decided they haven't- Yeah, uh, and, they also, and they also have like, uh, 
like this video system that if you put your mask down, then they'll take a picture and you, they send you a fine. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, you know, it's good. They will send you a fine, but not my friend from Israel, he showed me when you smoke, it's okay. I guess when you smoke, you <laughs> Or when you go to a bar and you go to bars all the time, it's okay to do that uh, there. But I guess, uh, you know, for now they're going to be on lockdown. In Germany, they did the same. So watch the videos and watch my, you know, lecture here. I explain why probability is right? stupid. Why the entire thing is uh, stupid. Anyhow. And if you don't believe me, you can argue with me. I'm, I, you but know, if I'm, this exponential curves that they usually show, mm -hmm. it's uh, in the probability field? Uh, well, the exponential curve is basically just any curve to make it look plenty, but uh, it's covered in lecture zero. Okay, mm -hmm. so go to calculus one. I mentioned it in lecture zero. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's let's go back to uh, to this material. But you see, this material applies to many things, right? So just hopefully trains your mind to be sharper, hopefully, right? Or at least to know what's what's useful information and what's not it's not always possible not always uh, easy. okay uh so, so uh, with yeah, this okay. problem you go three factorial multiplied by seven factorial and it's like eight minus one exactly we have to, exactly but, but, uh, because, because this box is uh is uh, filled in okay why did i want to divide i don't know <laughs> uh you know okay. i don't know it's, the reason, by the way, I haven't bothered you, you know, I'm obsessed. Once, once you have a math problem that, uh, and this looks to me like a big one, right? I, I'm obsessed. I cannot stop thinking or talking about it. The reason I haven't done the zero lecture with you is because I want to surprise you later on. About your, I want you to be wrong about this, right? And I want to enjoy it. That's why I haven't shown you lecture zero. Okay. So where are we? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so uh, here, right? So you, you understood uh, you understood this problem, right, guys? If so, let's see if we can generalize the situation. So we have n children in total, and one of the children are from camp one, and two of the children are in summer camp two, and all the way to n k, so n sub k of children are in camp number k. So obviously, all the children are in the in some camp. So we have the sum sum is all the children in total, and uh, you are asked to do the same things. In A and B, A is how many linear orders, how many ways of putting them in, one, in a row where people from the same camp are together. And um, in B, same thing, but uh, you put them on a merry-go-round. Well, there are no numbers here, right? So uh, be careful, guys, right? Uh, and one, and sub one, and sub two, and sub etc. This means uh, I'm trying to be general. And one means some number of children are in camp one, and two is some number of children in camp two. Blah blah. blah. Well, I didn't know. Maybe I added something, or maybe I changed the order of the questions. What does it matter? I don't remember what I said in my email. Yes, it's uh, it, it is it is maybe that maybe my my bad, right? Uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, I, 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 in the email, I just, I guess maybe you, you don't like abstracting, so I wanted to be sure that you have me here. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. All right, so do you, you guys, one thing is answering it correctly, that's great, but do you see a document, your Kafka document? Yes, you have it in your mind? That's uh, what I used uh, before I started doing that, I would make a mistake more frequently, okay? So I'm not very, really, you know, you can be easily confuse me, I'm not very agile. So uh, what I do is I use logic, so I'm hoping that it will prevent mistakes. Okay, that's what I imagine. So, because it's easy to think, oh, did they count something or miss something? So well, we're ready? Yes, right, I think we're ready. So here is uh, my uh, document now, okay? So uh, here I have the children lined up. Very useful if you want to work in German, right? Here I have the children lined up. And here I have the children from the other camp lined up. And onwards also camp K, 
the children are lined up. Yes. And the last is, uh, so, so here uh, I, I fill in how the children are lined up. And here I fill in uh, the camps, where are they seated? So uh, this is uh, first I see, second I see, which is the, which, which campus, do you agree? So if I read this information, I know uh, which children, is, which child is standing where. It, it tells me exactly how to put them together. This tells me how to put the camps together, and this tells me how to package every child into uh, within the respective uh, camp. Okay, so good, great, great. So here is the solution. Yes, so uh, I think uh, I've seen a lot of you did it correctly. And one factorial times a two factorial, all the way to n k factorial times k factorial, because because I just uh, have the things aligned here, and then here they are aligned further. We solved the question like that, I think, with books. Same similar idea. Good. Makes sense, yes, guys. Let me just be sure some people are shy and don't talk, or uh, yeah. Let's see who hasn't been talking. Uh, Jabeli, does it make sense or or confusing? Great, great. So, guys, not only makes sense, but uh, something that you hopefully enjoy and can do yourself. Huh? So. What about, uh, what about, what about uh, B? What happened with B now? Okay, uh, so blah, 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 but uh, you say divide by N Valeria, okay. What about the other guys, what do you say? I want to see more solutions. Okay, Bowen. Erica. And Naomi, you sub you say n minus one factorial, not sure uh, you mean uh, you mean n, n sub k minus one or something? Uh, n times k this k minus one. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. So let's see. Okay, Alejandro, uh, very good. So I think you get the idea. This is uh, my solution. Now, why? Because uh, you can decide where to begin. Right? You want to begin, I think it's easy to, uh, to you, can, you can cut anywhere between uh, any two individuals, you can cut, it's okay, right? But uh, it's, it's useful to cut between categories. So I will say camp one will always be the first camp, I see, you understand? When, when the very go around goes around, I want to start, as I say, begin reading it as soon as you, uh, as soon as the, it's like going with the, with the needle around the disc. I begin reading as soon as I hit camp one, okay? And I stop reading as soon as I hit camp one again. So I will make this equal to one here. Only in this box, I put it one. You follow me? And everything, so how many possibilities? So everything else stays the same because I, can, I imagine it's stacking them together, but the problem is that because I, I it's just, it just uh, first camp is always the first. That's the difference in, in, in merry-go-round. It's, it's, it's equivalent logically to camp number one being the uh, first ca uh, first camp in the linear order. Does it make sense, guys? I hope so, right? Because uh, good. Thank you. So it makes sense. So that's why you only subtract uh, from the number of camps one. You subtract one there. It's the same um, form, but I subtract one from the number of camps. So here is uh, a question number nine. Let's see if we can solve that one. We have uh, four computer science, five math, and 10 sociology majors. They are taking a six hour probability exam. Mm -hmm. 
So I do have truly trouble telling people apart sometimes. That maybe I had a stroke at some moment. I don't know. So I cannot tell people apart, so they look the same. Uh, so imagine that uh, uh, the computer science people and the math people and the sociology people are all wearing their t-shirt. They have a special t-shirt uh, so I can tell uh, who is who, right? And so the exam is six hours. And let's say what I report is, is uh, which category of student, how many of them, lives uh, at each hour. So let's say I have hour one, hour two, hour three, hour four, doesn't matter when they live during the hour, I just consider it as a new, right? If, if you live between uh, 12 and uh, 12.59, you left within the same hour, okay? So what I note is uh, how, many, how many students from each category left uh, in, in whichever hour. And I want to know how many possibilities are there. So Bowen says nine choose five, but nine choose five, uh, what, what's the nine about? Nine is, are you say, did they say there's a nine? I think there are four computer science, uh, five math and 10 sociology. Okay, so the nine is, I guess, uh, I don't know if it's five. Yes, uh, so Bowen, yes, perhaps your idea is completely right. It's just uh, some, some particular value here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm just, I'm sorry. Right? Uh, I think, I think uh, it's just, you know, my, maybe I glitched in my head. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see how many of you are ready. Okay. Thank you, Valeria. Interesting. All right, guys, let me know when you uh, want me to talk about this or uh, write. Okay, not sure. Well, the rest of you guys are sitting there. So are you trying to solve it or uh, you're waiting for me to do something? Just uh, write, move on or uh, write your solution. Okay, so I suppose I'll move on. But so here is what happens here. So. Again, I imagine them wearing uh, the shirt. So here is the computer science, here is the math, and I didn't draw the, because there are 10 of them, I didn't draw the other categories, right? So each of them is wearing a unique polo shirt. And uh, I cannot tell them apart, okay? But I can tell the red fonts uh, from the blue fonts, from maybe the green fonts apart, good? So here is uh, what, what happens here. We have three equations, right? So this, the, the, the x1 is uh, our one all the way to x6, which is our number six, okay? So in all those hours, I will see uh, the math students will go somehow. And in those hours, I will see the, what was the other thing? Computer science students and the sociology students will be the last equation, yes? So, and each of them will go supposedly, well, each of them can, uh, can go independently of the other. So uh, this means uh, how many solutions are there where 
each of the x's, each of the y's, and each of the z's are uh, non negative. Yes, so what you do here is uh, you insert the five bars because there are five bars to partition. So you have uh, four plus five. Uh, choose uh, of those, uh, choose that how many bars do you choose? Choose, uh, uh, choose five. Good. Five of the uh, spaces for the bars. I choose the spaces. So this is how many spaces I have in total to contain uh, to contain uh, the blue points and the bars that will separate them. And I just multiply them in between. You understand why I multiply in between? Because uh, uh, each of those equations is solved independently of the other. I can see a solution of this equation. Uh, we have the number then uh, for, for, any num for any solution in here, I can have any solution in here. And for any of those two, I can have any here. So I just multiply multiply them up and this is what I get. And Bo, when you are absolutely correct, it's nine choose five, 10 choose five, 15 choose five. It looks like uh, a lot of you are already excellent at it. So very good, very good. So uh, I ended up uh, covering this material faster than I imagined. So what we can do now is we have what? Another uh, 10 minutes, am I right? 30 minutes, yes? We can uh, maybe do this. I am, let's, let's actually go and talk about, it's a bit interesting, I know. maybe I should have done it later, but why not? Why is it uh, choose five again? Uh, oh, let me go back to it. So you remember the previous lecture where I introduced this material. So one way to do that, you can uh, either solve it in a generalized way I introduced many ways of solving it. One way to solve it when uh, each of the axes could be zero is uh, I imagine there are four objects and the objects uh, will be separated by, it's like you have this, uh, not escalator, what do you call it? Again, uh, this running, so Melissa, I think you told me what it's called, I can't remember it anymore again, right? So you have I'm this very treadmill, treadmill, right? You have this, uh, treadmill when you go to the store and uh, how do you decide uh, which items belong to which person? You have those uh, bars that uh, separate your items from another, right? So what you have here to separate into, uh, for the six buyers, we will separate using five bars. Understand? Because uh, between each two bars, between the start and the first bar, that's uh, uh, what person number one is buying. In this case, our one is buying, right? Uh, between uh, uh, between first bar and second bar, that's person number two. Between second and third, person number three. And if uh, between them there is this empty space, uh, that means this person is not buying anything. Okay, so we have four identical objects because the math people are all the blue ones. They are uh, or sorry, the red ones. Computer science. They are all the same. Yes, and uh, we will separate them with five bars. So we have how many spaces for all the items? Bars and, uh, and uh, the computer science people, we have uh, four plus five spaces. And out of those spaces, I decide which spaces to pick for the bars. So the sparks refers to the bars. Good. Excellent, right? yes. And it's very nice. All right. so. Let me show you uh, then uh, this this thing, which I will again talk about it. Probably talk about it faster during the lecture where it's supposed to appear. Yes, guys. So this is, by the way, Alexander Bloch, which is a very good Russian poet. I just found the translation here. Here is uh, one question that I would like you to think about. Okay, and you can think about answer now. So you are invited to a household known to have two children. You have never seen these children and have no prior knowledge about them. 
as you park your car, you notice that one child is playing in the yard and she is a girl. What's the probability that both children are girls? We haven't talked about probability, of course, the question doesn't have to make sense, but you probably have some notion of probability. Kazim, you say 0 0.5, okay. B, you, you can be in Gabriel says uh, 0 0.5, or 50%, Shotaro says 50%, okay. Who else? Kazim, uh, but uh, try to reason it out. And you will say, uh, you're bored, right? I just mentioned it so many times. <laughs> All right, uh, some people say 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 ball and 0 0.25, anybody else? Well, uh, Alejandro, you uh, hit, no. okay, 0 0.25, Melissa. All right, are we ready? Guys, you all have a notion of something, right? Uh, and I haven't heard from, I think maybe if I'm not wrong, I haven't heard from Naomi, I haven't heard from, uh, well, a bunch of people. No? Come on, uh, you, 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 everybody here can answer this question, am I right? At least you don't have to answer it correctly, but you can answer this question. You, it, it should be something uh, imaginable, right? Okay, maybe I have. Okay, so let's solve this question. Uh, so here is here it's called Leibniz error, guys. Okay, and what's Leibniz error? Leibniz error means that uh, well, Leibniz said that if you roll a pair of dice, the probability of getting twelve, the sum twelve, or the sum eleven is the same because to get twelve you must have six and six, and to get eleven you must have five and six. Okay, so you unconsciously perhaps make the same error if you say it's 50 percent right let's say assume that the probability that uh, a child is either is a girl is uh, by itself 50 percent yes but here you don't know anything about the children so you are not focused on the right object here you um, have to count the, the full universe understand so maybe that's a good uh, habit to develop everything that you look that you every every information can have an effect because it determines the particular universe in which you live it's like when you you watch Rick and Morty I'm sure right it somehow became very popular so he travels to universe parallel universes so what you're doing you are counting here possible parallel universes with uh, you know some of them are more likely to be the universe where you are located so what happens here is that you don't know if it's the oldest child or the youngest child you're observing okay so uh well it matters it's not the ages but matters in this case is uh, oldest or youngest right age actually uh you, you have to think uh, you cliche to say why that would not matter but wait for this question so really with this information uh, you know that you are either observing the universe uh, of both girls gg which means oldest and youngest child is girl uh, are girls or you're observing this universe which is uh, a boy oldest and girl youngest or you're observing this universe where uh, girl is oldest and boy is young you understand so the probability uh, that you are observing this universe they are always really likely is one third see that three of them one third is this we're going to talk about probability at length this is extremely important right it's one third do you follow me guys uh, you are counting, you see, one thing that you are making a mistake about 
is you are counting just the children, but you are forgetting that what you are really counting is the universe. The full universe is what you need to observe. So the full universe, uh, simplified of course, is this or that or that. Each of them are equally likely. Uh, one out of three is your answer. Good. Now, next question is this. A mother comes to greet you and she starts yapping around and then she mentions, by the way, this child you are watching over there, she was born on a Wednesday, on some Wednesday. What's the probability that both children are girls? That's Kazim. Kazim might be an answer to your question. Okay. What's the probability that both are girls? It's an interesting question, isn't it, Shotaro? Uh, no, uh, B followed by G Kazi uh, means uh, it's like with the die. You see, uh, Leibniz, he was a genius, so don't feel bad if you make a mistake. He said that uh, to get 12, you have to have 6 and 6, and to get 11, you must have uh, 5 and 6. And therefore, because there's only one possibility, 6 and 6 or 5 and 6, uh, he concluded that probability for 11 is the same as probability for 12. But uh, he was mistaken. The probability for 11 is twice, 11 is twice as likely as 12. Why? Because you might have die number one displaying five or die number one displaying six. You understand? There are actually two possibilities. So same thing here. Boy, girl or boy, girl uh, are different possibilities. This means die number one. This means die number two or coin because it's the children's gender you can imagine here is the coin. Um, would it be one has to assume that the girl uh, we see is, if you assume it's the youngest one, then uh, it is one half, but we don't assume it. So, uh, Morshika, if we assume, not assume, if, if we know it's the youngest girl, you are correct, it's one half, right? But we don't know whether youngest or oldest, that's not uh, how the question was phrased. Yes? So what about this thing, you see, so uh, she says, uh, so mother says, the girl you're looking at was born on Wednesday. You don't have to worry, you can, uh, if, you, if you believe it doesn't affect the uh, probability, you can, you can tell me, right, I just want to see what you think. So Shutara, you say one third, okay. What about the rest of you guys? And if you heard my answer, uh, you just know. One third. You see, once one person says one third, and then you have two more people that join because they become brave. They think, well, if I'm idiot, then I'm not the only one, right? So what about the rest of you guys? Say as a part A, which means one third value. Yes? Yes. Okay, who else? And uh, Chabeli, what about you? Let me hear from you. What about you, Bowen? Well, seven, uh, one, nine, 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 nine. Well, no idea. Okay, are we ready? Well, I don't know. Depends uh, uh, what blows your mind. To me, it's uh, mind blowing is just a bullet. So, here is 
uh, here is uh, what you are actually counting, right? You are focused on the girls, but uh, that's incorrect, right? You imagine, well, uh, Wednesday does not affect uh, gender, that's true. But uh, you have to focus, your object is always the full universe, understand? But that's why even those questions, you have to be always very careful, did I model it correctly? Right? It is a focus on uh, the entire universe. Now, with the information we have here, our universe is rather poor, right? Uh, I haven't mentioned the color of my car, so, uh, so it's not part of the universe here. Uh, the universe can be represented as follows. It's a vector where uh, it has four co uh, coordinates. X and Y are the genders of the two children. X is the gender of oldest child. Y is the gender of youngest child. And this is the day of the week they were born. We're not assuming anything about weeks. We imagine it's equally likely to be any day, okay? So, uh, so then what universe have we observed? We have observed the universe of type uh, girl Wednesday. In other words, oldest girl was born on a Wednesday and nothing is known about the youngest child. Or uh, the youngest child was born on a Wednesday and she's a girl. Okay, and nothing is known about the oldest child. So those are the two universes, two types of universes that we have observed. Now I need to count how many universes are there. That's where we have the combinatorial analysis, right? So uh, how many universes are there of, the, of uh, this first type? Well. Of this first type, uh, there, there are exactly uh, two times seven, two times seven universes. So 14 universes of this type, uh, and 14 universes of this type, where I overcounted the universe girl double, uh, yeah, this universe, okay, where both are girls and both uh, born on a Wednesday. So I take two times 14 to count all my possible universes and subtract one. Now, I mean, one of 27 possible universes. Maybe not one, but I mean in, in the 27, uh, I mean some one out of 27 possible universes. But how many of the universes correspond to there being two girls? If there are two girls, I'm looking at universes where uh, I have uh, girl Wednesday and the, this is girl, so there is seven degrees of freedom in, in two types of universes. Understand? Either oldest girl, everything known about her, and youngest girl, only known as the girl. And again, uh, so there are two times seven minus one. Uh, one because of overcounting, because I again count uh, girl, uh, Wednesday, girl, Wednesday, twice. So I have two times seven minus one. There are 13 possibilities where uh, there are 13 universes in which I would find both girls. So the answer is uh, 13 divided by 27. Isn't it interesting? So uh, this information makes it 13 divided by 27. And uh, your mistake is that you are not picking, uh, you are, you're just focusing on an aspect of the universe, but you have to focus on the full universe. Is it very interesting, guys? And uh, uh, you know where I go from here, right? My point is that uh, given some information, most people, I would say 90%, will think of it incorrectly. And uh, if they are also thinking about it incorrectly and very passionately, then you have a disaster. And that's the disaster, yes? And uh, then I go and uh, you can read about it and, and see the references. I go about discussing uh, the statistics or how it's presented for the pandemic, right? For the second wave, for the causes of it, et cetera. And if you're interested, uh, read it. It's uh, calculus, here is where it is, right? You go to uh, Math 150. You're there. You, you type on uh, uh, coronavirus virus lecture note, you type on uh, one limit and you take zero, okay? Lecture zero. If you're interested, uh, read the full lecture, watch the videos that I suggested. There are some translations of some videos that I posted on YouTube and you can discuss it with me if you're in, right? And you can tell me where you agree or disagree if you feel completely comfortable, I don't go crazy, right? So uh, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed uh, the lecture. We will begin, I will send you an interesting video to introduce probability. And uh, I think next class we will try to review uh, infinite series. Or if you haven't uh, any notion of infinite series, hopefully I will explain it in a way that you will know it without uh, having any, any other information before. Right? So uh, from this lecture onwards, it might be already, if you haven't taken calc through, might be uh, slightly more challenging, but hopefully with my review, and even if you think you know infinite series, I, I'm sure I will catch some of you. If you don't know it well enough, I will talk about uh, that. Good. And then we will begin with probability. All right, guys, if you don't have any questions, uh, goodbye.
So this is like the end of chapter one. This is the end of chapter one. Yes, we finished chapter one. Oh, uh, if you want to, you, you know, you know, you have, uh, you can see quite a few things here, right? So uh, you have, where is it? Um, you have uh, in start, uh, in start statistics here. What do we have here? Uh, we have uh, homework, and you have homework for chapter one. Blah blah blah, right? You can try uh, doing those problems. Good. So work on those problems. Mm -hmm. Those are my suggested problems. Uh, you, you can work on a bunch of others, and we can try to talk about. Good. Uh, help us out. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Hey, Professor. Yeah. I just had uh, the question for on the email that you. Stop the recording. My, my apologies.